Please sing, Chris. Dwight Yoakam, please. Out. Oh, huh? Dwight Yoakam. Dwight Yoakam. Chris is Johnny Cash fan, Dan. Johnny Cash? Chris. He's not a Johnny Cash fan. You. All right, we are live. We usually give a second, as we've said every week, to let people join the room, join the chat. Um, we didn't have to stop talking about Johnny Cash, but <laughs> <laughs> we did. I was just saying that Chris a was a huge fan of this. <laughs> Chris, a great uh, singer. He does yeah. a great, great version of that uh, Bruce Springsteen song, uh, "Further On Up the Road." I don't know if you ever heard that. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. He's done some incredible Ooh. covers. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I guess we'll begin, um, and people can kind of find us if they're just trickling in. Week ten. Can you believe it? No, I can't believe Ten. it. Crazy. Just, just flown by. Um, yes. We are joined this week, obviously, by Dr. Tracy Bear and Dr. Paul Garrow. And this week, we get Dr. Chris Anderson um, joining us. Um, I would just want to call you Dr. Chris. You should. <laughs> However you'd like to be referred to. Um, <laughs> Maybe just like fill fill the group in on on who you are and and uh, why you're here today. Sure. Uh, well, I'm uh, my name's uh, Chris Anderson. I've been at the University of Alberta. This is my 25th year at the University of Alberta. Uh, I'm originally uh, from uh, Saskatchewan. I'm uh, Métis from uh, uh, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, and uh, regions <laughs> north of there. Um, yeah, I do a lot of research on uh, Métis identity. I do a lot of research on urban indigeneity. In the last five or six years, I've been the Dean of the Faculty of uh, Native Studies. And so I'm uh, quite excited to be here and of course, uh, very, very honored to be included. I'm happy to have you here. You're welcome, Chris. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. <laughs> so uh, I have to say that when I came back to university in 2002, Chris was one of my very first instructors. Um, yeah. Yeah, he was. What so. was it like? He was scary. He I was bet. scary, but he's brilliant. So, you know, mm -hmm. um, brilliant scares me, I guess. I don't know. So, <laughs> It was great being in his class. So it's really amazing because um, that was 2002. Now here we are in 2020, mm -hmm. almost, well, 18 years later. And look what we're doing. It's, it's amazing. So it's amazing. welcome, Chris. Oh, Thank so you. The, Thank next, you. the next thing that we do is uh, we smudge um, and uh, got to fill up my little jar because it seems to be emptying pretty fast. You're smudging too much. <laughs> Not enough. So I smudged with enough. my granddaughter yesterday. Uh, it was not her first time, but she, uh, it's amazing how children, she's like one years old and she's just like moving the smoke back and forth, you know, not understanding it, but still going through the motions. It's just mm -hmm. such a beautiful thing. And for those of you out there, here's for a good conversation. May we come to this with good hearts and good minds, good for listening and also for speaking. I'll put this back here. All right. Hi, hi. Hi, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Dan, week 10, it was a pretty uh, indigenous in the city. So had a lot in there, but we got some really cool questions um, to talk about Great. later. But I'm just wondering uh, how's things going for you and what do you think of the mod module? I, th I found this to be like an incredibly necessary, I mean, every week has been necessary, but I think this is, this is certainly an area that I think I, I speak for myself and, and not for, for everybody else, but I would imagine that this is kind of 
a conversation that um, is new to a lot of people mm. in terms of new information, um, new information about a lot of things. I think, um, you know, the, the big takeaway for me is just uh, conceptually speaking has been about um, just because people are moving into big cities does not mean that communities don't need resources within those cities in order to grow and be rooted and be, you know, have access to um, the same things that, that other people do. And, you know, I think this speaks to this, this kind of conversation about um, how it's the assimilation conversation about the idea that if um, indigenous people were to move into um, rural communities that they were essentially kind of giving up their culture. When in actuality, I think the, 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 the big takeaway from this, this week's lesson is that it has nothing to do with giving up or losing touch with culture. It, sh it should be the same, you should have the same kind of connection regardless of where you live. You do, however, need, from a governmental standpoint, you do need certain resources um, as communities to succeed, to have the same kind of opportunities, to have places to go when people are coming into these sort of, you know, larger rural environment or larger sort of big city environments, um, and just ensuring that um, that those kinds of places, institutions um, are are being funded, are being recognized, and that this isn't, you know, that we aren't sort of contributing to this idea that culture is lost when you come to the big city. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And Chris, what do you think <clears throat> about Dan's sort of thoughts here? Meandering. <laughs> um, well, I, 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 I agree, obviously, and I think um, a large part of the, I mean, we were, we were talking about this before we went live, but a large part of the conceptual register for most Canadians or, or most non-Indigenous people living in countries where there are sizable uh, urban Indigenous populations is that there's this kind of deeply seated stereotype about Indigeneity as something that was in the past, right? So real Indigeneity was rather than is. And I think for a lot of people, they see people moving into urban spaces as being uh, kind of on the pathway to um, to losing our our culture, basically, right? And so, you know, in the in the module, we talk about how for many people, both in policy and in everyday life, they really thought about this in terms of uh, cities are where Indigenous people go to live and Indigenous culture goes to die. But one of the things we see over the past kind of five, six generations now of, of Indigenous people living in cities, residing in cities, is the incredible amount of uh, cultural innovation and power that's come from the communities that have formed. And in, in more recently, that's in part due to funding that uh, various levels of government have given. But for the longest part, it was despite uh, the, the kind of cold shoulder uh, that uh, governments demonstrated for Indigenous peoples uh, living in urban areas. I mean, there's a ton of literature out there about how um, urban municipalities attempt to erase Indigenous people both uh, conceptually and physically from, uh, from urban spaces. Uh, but I think um, Indigenous communities in urban spaces are some of the most powerful communities that we have. Mm -hmm. Very true. Uh, and I come, I come up against that all the time when people think about Indigenous communities, they're often their mind goes to either reserves or Métis settlements or somewhere where there's a large, you know, um, similar, like all Cree, all Blackfoot, all sort of, you mm -hmm. know, Dene or Soto um, people. But really, I find communities and urban centers popping up everywhere and it's with a, a like-mindedness or having some sort of goal or unity you know we see communities everywhere we go with walking with our sisters and in, inside some prisons you know and lots of lots of student groups and things like that and there's a diversity of indigenous people within that and so i think we really need to rethink what community really means especially with indigenous people 
-hmm. And I think there was a lot of, I think in this week's lesson too, just laying out the, the foundational like base information of what it takes for someone to come to a big city and have the same level of access and um, mm -hmm. sort of general equality that a settler would have. And for me, you know, I, 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 the, 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 the lines of sort of the connective, the connective tissue in my mind as I was reading those kinds of the, the information, the, um, the reality of what it is for so many people who come to, to urban centers, I couldn't help but draw a comparison to a lot of the queer community that is, that comes to urban centers to find a sense of community, to find employment, to find a life for themselves that they might not have um, at home. A lot of queer yeah. kids are being kicked out of their house and they come to the big city to start anew. And a lot of, I think a lot of people who are scrapping it out in the big city don't understand that for many communities coming to the big city, you are up against far more than just the intimidation of like getting a job in a big city. You have so many odds stacked against you just from where you came from that it's crucial that these kind of community-based organizations continue to be funded and continue to be kind of lifted because that is where people are coming together to get those first formative steps so that they can have access to the same kinds of jobs and opportunities that, you know, in, in this conversation that settler people have had for centuries. So that level of awareness that other people in other communities have a lot more than just, we're coming to the big city and we're gonna scrap it out until we get to the top. That's, a, that's almost a luxury for, for settlers. <laughs> like a lot of people are working just on a lot more sort of core fundamental opposition than just, I wonder if I'm gonna get the job out of the 10 people that are applying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, Chris, you were talking a little bit about the um, institutions and infrastructure that we build within cities for urban people. Did you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. We, we were just we were talking earlier about the importance of institutions um, as um, you know friendly spaces for people who are coming into a city. And you think about the the manner in which uh, people, I mean, especially right now with everyone kind of losing their jobs and whatnot, people don't tend to see um, the, the the hierarchy that gets created in colonial society, right? And so, uh, Dan, you were talking earlier about kind of how it can be a luxury for people to be in a situation where they can kind of fight it out for the job in a, in a particular situation. And one of the things that uh, institutions do, and uh, David Newhouse and others have written about the importance of institutions to urban Indigenous communities is to actually create a, a, a space, a safe space for Indigenous peoples who are coming into urban spaces for the first time and also for those who've lived in urban spaces for a number mm -hmm. of generations. Uh, there's a lot of uh, research that shows that there are things like the equivalent of a Canadian Friendship Centre, which is kind of an enduring institution in, in urban spaces in Canada, all over the world for Indigenous people to come and connect to. Some of them are larger than others. Some of them are more well-connected than others. Some of them have what are called wraparound services. So they're not just there as a welcoming space. There's, you can, you can get a doctor, you can get a eyeglass specialist, those kinds of things. But it's really important to think about how institutions can play a role in leveling the, the playing field. And then also think about from that, how important it is to fund those institutions in an ongoing as opposed to piecemeal manner, which is what often happens in urban spaces. And so you end up getting organizations that can't afford to be a one issue organization. They have to they have to kind of tie themselves to a bunch of different kinds of issues and a bunch of different kinds of social services because it's the only way that they can cobble together money uh, to be able to do what it is they do. And very often they can't even get multi-year money, they get single year money. And so they yep. spend a lot of their time just applying for the money to get more money, to get more money. So it's this, it's almost like Wile E. Coyote at the end of the cliff kind of running, 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 <laughs> running, trying to, trying to stay in the air. I did some research a little while ago and one of the people told me that they spent 70% of their time applying for grants to, mm -hmm. to keep the doors open for the following, for the following year. 
So what the hell can you do in a situation where you're spending 70% of your time applying for the right to exist, basically? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And even the example in the module about Nietzsche Commons, right, that's since right. has been closed down. Yeah. And that was a really popular and quite an amazing space, right? right. Yeah. So frick, you know, like that's like how many places have been closed down since we published this thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because of this uh, Wiley Coyote funding model that we've got, right? But it's this, it's this whole precarity that comes from a needs-based model rather than a rights-based model, that's right? right. So the, one of the major differences between a needs-based model and a rights-based model is the people that give money in a needs-based model are doing it out of a sense of charity. You can pull it back anytime they want. A rights-based model, usually you have rights to convince people to give you resources that they're not otherwise predisposed to give. And so when you think about kind of the conceptual differences between those things, you start to see the importance of having stable, long-term funding attached to rights as opposed to more patchwork, short-term funding that tends to get attached to needs. So what's the problem, Kristen? Because like right now we could see what are rights based in Canadian society, like rights to healthcare, rights to justice, like what are those compared to how indigenous rights, uh, indigenous needs for rights in the things in society in general, you know, like, well, it's what needs to change. It's less important to think about what specific rights come out of any particular context than it is to think about the nature of the relationship that leads to an agreement about mm -hmm. funding, about whatever rights that agreement agrees to, right? So if you think about the, the nation to nation agreements that the various Métis nations have been signing those kinds of things, yeah, we shouldn't kind of, we shouldn't predispose what those, what those relationships or those agreements are going to look like. That comes through negotiations between kind of representatives of both, of both sides. And so the issue here is not so much which particular things are seen as rights, it's the relationship that, that underlies and kind of adheres those things together that becomes important. And this goes back to kind of a larger discussion about how do we switch from a mindset in which Indigenous people are seen as problems to be solved to yep. one in which Indigenous people are seen as partners to be engaged with. That's right. So it's a structural issue, right? Like that's that's what's going on. Like, so it's an issue of structural racism. Yeah, well, right? I mean, I'm a sociologist by training. I'm a recovering sociologist. So it's always about structure for me. Gotcha. <laughs> Recovering sociology. Right. Well, I'm happy you got, you're still on the wagon, Chris. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just trying to make some connections here with regards to rights-based and needs-based. Yeah. And I sort of asked this question last time when we were talking about, well, another number of times about UNDRIP. Like, why was it that Canada was the last one to, to sign UNDRIP, you know, what have they got to lose? And the same with rights-based funding as compared to needs-based funding. What does Canada have to lose? Do they have anything really to lose if they negotiate within a rights-based paradigm? Wow, that's a that's a huge question. Uh, I don't have a I don't have a a particularly sophisticated response to the UNDRIP uh, part of the question, other than to say that it was a combination of who was in government at the time. It was a combination of what they, what government lawyers were probably concerned about might be the implications, because a lot of this is about risk management as opposed to what people think or know it's definitely going to, going to happen. In terms of rights-based funding now, I know there's lots of Indigenous people out there that quite legitimately kind of have quasi conspiracy theories, conspiracy theory ideas about uh, pudgy white people sitting at desks, waking up every morning, thinking about how they can screw indigenous people over as probably some of that. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is the weight of bureaucracy uh, pushes things in particular ways. And over time that kind of congeals and then kind of calcifies into particular accepted ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. And so when people come along with a new idea about about why we want to do things. So we want five years of funding or seven years of funding or that kind of thing. You're going to get a government that's only in power probably for four years, at least it yeah. has until, at least until it goes to election again, saying, well, wait a minute, we're not putting in power or we're not putting in place seven, seven years of funding. The, the liberals lately have kind of gone against that to put in kind of longer term funding. But I think a lot of the rights-based stuff raises the specter of going to courts. And almost every time government goes to courts, it loses. Uh, and then that puts in place particular kinds of um, uh, relationships and promises around, you know, kind of connected to the honor of the crown and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So all of this kind of battle is to say that 
uh, when there's less certainty, people who are in positions of power who have all the toys get to decide who they give the toys to and how many of the toys they give. And when you get rights-based funding and you're worried about what that might look like when it gets run through the machine of the courts, it reduces your kind of ability to be flexible in terms of whether the GDP is going up or yeah. down or, mm -hmm. or those kinds of things. That, mm -hmm. that was very... That was wonderful. I mean, you made a complex question and sorry, I just brought that out of the blue, but it kind of bubbled up in my mind as we we're talking about this. Um, because it, it seems as such, it could be such a barrier and it can be such roadblocks, if you forgive the pun, um, yeah. for Indigenous people to gain rights-based funding or even just like self-determination there seems to be some sort of fear from not only our, our governments, federal and provincial governments, but also Canadian society at large, as, as if there is something that they will lose out on if the Indigenous people are granted sort of any of these rights. Big time. Well, yeah, and, and they're certainly not going to lose out on anything that isn't already given to corporations on a, uh, on a daily basis in terms of, you know, tax... Um, uh, taxed holidays and all of the different kinds of things that corporately minded uh, government do already. So why are people so scared to about uh, about this indigenous engagement? Like, what's what's all the fear? Because there's all this uh, racism that comes through about you know indigenous people don't pay taxes, they always get a free ride. All of these things that come out in a lot of like um, some of the questions we get and some how we engage in things, right? So it's like if if this is clearly a system, what are, the, what are settlers fighting for and why are they fighting against indigenous sovereignty so much? <sighs> uh, Maybe well. they're fighting for the status quo. They wanna keep the people that are in power in power or not the people per se, but the structures, they the wanna keep those. Power. They wanna keep those, it works for them. So why change? Well, and the other part of this is that people who don't very don't say or don't know very much sometimes say really dumb shit. But just just full stop. Sometimes when people don't kind of have a good complex or sophisticated understanding of an issue, and I'm not talking here about kind of academics versus others because there's academics that say a lot of dumb shit as well. Mm -hmm. But when people don't have a kind of a mature understanding of something, then they fall back to kind of simplistic stereotypes about what mm -hmm. they think. And very yeah. often we get into the kind of you know thinking or saying things that are based on our opinion rather than something that we've actually spent some time looking into, you see the results of that on a fairly regular basis. More so sadly these days on social media, but obviously it's not limited to that because we have, you know, we have um, uh, uh, commentators who write for uh, national newspapers who say yeah. similar kinds of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Opinion versus fact-based fact commentary is so crucial. And I think is what is so fundamental to this, to what I called like the toxicity of, of uh, social media is just a lot of people who, you know, I, and, and don't get me wrong, I think to have your voice heard for a lot of people is a really necessary and empowering thing. But at the same time, I think without proper information, it can be incredibly dangerous, destructive and completely toxic. Yeah. So that really encapsulates, I think, such a crucial um, hub of what has become information um, created essentially in many cases out of nothing but an opinion, thin air and some words on a page. And yet, because it exists on the internet, it is given power, a sense of authority and a sense of legitimacy just because it's there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's a big one. That's a big one. And the thing I would say, uh, one of the ways to differentiate between kind of um, fairly ignorant opinions and more considered facts is what are the kinds of questions that they produce, right? So, if the, so we often tell our students, I don't need you to have answers at the end of this class. I want you to have more sophisticated questions than you had mm. uh, at the beginning of the class. And this is what we're hoping with the MOOC as well, is that people don't walk away with answers. They walk yeah. away with more sophisticated questions and a desire to learn even more about what they don't know. Mm. major mm -hmm. yeah. huge absolutely and paul you you said you mentioned something that's um pertinent here and how um there is a dearth of, of of something that happens in social media and on twitter that doesn't 
of relationship that really affects the conversation. And so you compared our conversations here with Dan with social media. Did you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, um, it's funny because I think like uh, social media has this, and we talk about this all the time. I'm not an expert on any of this because I hardly know how to use Instagram. So I'm still trying to figure this stuff out. I've only joined Instagram thanks to Dan Levy. I've been liking your posts. I think you're doing great on social media. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to share. Anyways, uh, I think this is what's really important about this uh, this space that, uh, that we've made together with Tracy, you, Dan, and me, and then inviting our faculty in as an institution is these relations that we are, that we're, where we're centering. And it's not about authority and it's not about expertise. Um, it's all about like giving ourselves to this, this space that we've created together and visiting. I really like the idea of visiting. And Chris, uh, man, I, I, it's a really strong part of who I am. It's part of a strong part of many indigenous people's perspectives is that the visiting is important so that we all come together to hear each other to listen as much as to talk right and people like Chris coming into the circle and like having these amazing insights in like a real reflection on the structures creates new questions for us you know and like mm. and all of the commentary that I've been getting from my relatives and from those relatives relatives are really positive and it's been such a an amazing thing even we've been giving our weekends off for like what 10 weekends now or more yeah. right it's like, I work all the time, but this is so giving. And it's like, what if life was always like this, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of always being like bashing me on the head with your, with your knowledge, we could just share and listen and like res respect each other a little. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, very I, special. I think, I think it speaks to the, to the conversation we've been having about removing the walls that are being constructed around certain people in certain communities so that we can be uh, more part of a conversation and more aware of who people are, where they're coming from and what they have to say. It's just been very easy for a lot of people to make decisions, to say things, whether it's on the internet, a lot of vile things are written on the internet because you're not in a conversation. You yeah. have the freedom and the no strings attached approach to just <laughs> doing something out yeah. and yeah. not having to answer or be responsible for what you're saying. And I think the more conversations that are had in a way that feels safe and respectful, the more change that can happen because th those are where ties are formed. Those are where bonds are formed. And it's a lot harder to legislate or to push people out or to be intolerant of any kind if you have relations with people, as you were saying, Paul, it's, it just, mm -hmm. it personalizes an experience and we need more personalization because I think what we are as to just tie this back to the, the concept of the internet, we have been so distanced from human interaction. We spend more time for some, for a lot of us looking at our phones than we do our own friends and family members. So the concept of getting together people, whether it's over this kind of medium or in person with your family members safely and having conversations, it's like you are repairing what the internet and what technology has actively sort of dismantled, which is yeah. human interaction and, the, and, and the, the, the power of like human empathy and compassion and interaction. And energy exchange, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, I like the idea of ethical responsibility to people that you know, you know, uh, the internet's full of strangers, mm -hmm. <laughs> stranger danger, right? Mm -hmm. And this is, this is a time for us to get to know each other mm -hmm. and to have re ethical responsibility and reciprocity to one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you, I personally, I can just compare the feelings I have after, say, I've had a, a bout of w reading Twitter and, and feeling like, like complete crap after compared to how this conversation goes and no matter how difficult it can get um, and the things that we bring up, I still feel good at the end of it because I feel safe, I feel supported and I feel yeah. like everyone here is accountable, but um, yeah. And to bring this back to cities, this is an important reflection to think about us living in, in a city 
as mm. indigenous people and then living online as indigenous people you got to take that relationality and center it in all the things that you do and we often always just think of rural spaces because they're so so uh, homogenous right we always think of them as there's a reserve community or like a family community or whatever you know and we, we always think of that as being the place where collectivity resides but mm. this is where collectivity resides it resides on facebook like all my aunties and uncles know exactly what's going on on Facebook through my posts and my family and all the stupid jokes I say, right? So, and that's all about visiting, right? So, but I think yeah. it's I think it's important too not to get too caught up in the idea that um, that urban spaces are somehow separate uh, from yes. or not separate but unconnected from rural spaces, right? It's more important to think about urban spaces as hubs. Yes, so they're hubs of uh, there's a a sociologist by the name of Anthony Giddens that talks about uh, cities as power containers. So basically all he's saying is that there's a, a ton of administrative and allocative resources in it. You get tons of people that come together with a, a bunch of money and a ton of infrastructure, all of that kind of stuff. It produces particular kinds of things. They're cultural generators. But indigenous people, we, we, we talk about urban indigenous people and rural indigenous people as though these are different people. But when you think about the amount of movement between rural and urban spaces from uh, big cities to small cities, from small cities to towns, from towns to more rural areas, et cetera, et cetera, you have people moving back and forth all the time. You have people who have cousins who live in particular areas that are different than the ones that you live in. So it's more important to think about the ways in which urban and rural spaces are connected to each other by like literally by social relations. We're connected by kind of extended family uh, among all of these different kinds of spaces. It's shaped in particular ways by, by the internet, by social media. But as long as we continue to think about these as entirely different spaces, then we're kind of reproducing. You know, one of the, one of the arguments about colonialism is that colonialism has got people to think that indigenous people can only be one thing or that all of us can only be one thing. There's all these binaries, right? You're either rural or urban, you're either authentic or you're not, those kinds of things. And when you start to think about cities as hubs, then you, you can explode those binaries and start to think about all the different ways in which culture circulates, right? So we, we think about rural spaces as these spaces where culture resides and culture is produced and people go to, go to cities. And we no longer think about cities as places where culture goes to die now, but maybe it's an attenuated form. But you think of all of the kinds of indigenous culture that gets created with all of these different indigenous people from different nations coming together in the same space and then it goes back to, to rural spaces, you can see that the direction of cultural production is going both ways. Yeah, yeah. that's a really good distinction, Chris. And it sort mm -hmm. of leads into our, our questions. Um, we have uh, questions? We have questions, yes. <laughs> we always get to them about halfway through, right? That was our preamble. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is from Azra and has a question about the experience of Indigenous people who are considered middle class uh, slash professional. Has it been fairly straightforward path to progress or is there still the racism encountered by the communities? Also, is this kind of progress viewed by those who live on the reserve? Is it seen as a positive move or one that takes people further away from their culture and ways? Is it possible to move seamlessly between the two? Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, Chris, you were talking earlier uh, about this. And so it's a really nice segue into talking about this question. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that there is a, a probably a growing middle class of or yeah, there's a growing middle strata of uh, I, I just did this, I just did the classic assholey thing that academics do, which is trying to think about what the genealogy of the term class is and whether I would sort of think of all these people as being part of the same class, which mm -hmm. I don't, yeah. There's a growing number of indigenous people that have a little bit of money. Um, <laughs> I think that it's definitely, um, colonialism always ensures that there are gonna be rumble strips no matter what you do. So if you've ever been driving on kind of highways in Canada and you're coming to a, a stop sign on a highway that's there for it's no reason whatsoever that you can tell, but you get those rumble strips that you hit before you get there. It's never it's never smooth for for uh, anybody kind of as a on average. You have to talk to individual people about whether they see it personally as being a smooth process. I'd say it's not. In terms of moving away from culture, you know, it's really interesting. We have this premise in Canada that the wealthier somebody gets, the less indigenous we are, right? Mm -hmm. 
And we have all these kind of statistical measures over the past 150 years that are all geared to demonstrating the poverty of indigeneity. Yeah. But if you go to a place like New Zealand, for example, they have much different uh, uh, indicators that they use to kind of measure stuff in, in Maori communities there, in Indigenous communities there, that kind of doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily uh, kind of connect indigeneity and poverty. Of course, there's lots of Indigenous people who are impoverished. But this whole idea that becoming middle class automatically makes us less Indigenous or is more likely to make us less Indigenous is part and parcel of the way in which colonialism has played itself out over the past 150 years uh, in Canada. So yeah, I would say that there probably isn't a single spirit, a single experience of kind of moving toward being, uh, being middle class. I would say that it's almost always bumpy. I would say that uh, you're far, far less likely to sort of move away from your culture uh, by becoming middle class. Uh, the only kind of caveat to that is if your one of your parents is Indigenous and marries a non-Indigenous person and you move away from community of any kind, then there's kind of some discussion about that. But those I see as being two separate kinds of two separate kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. And you had a good point um, that I'd like you just to make uh, about the discipline of Indigenous studies before we go on, because I think it's really a really important dis um, definition of Indigenous studies and really has something to say uh, about our next conversation. What was my, what, what did I say? Yeah, Chris. Um, <laughs> rather than making simple things. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, anyone who's in the faculty has heard me say this a thousand times, but uh, Indigenous studies is the exact opposite of most academic disciplines. Uh, most academic disciplines take things that are really complex and then they break them uh, down into easier to understand chunks. Because of the kinds of things that we work with, we do the opposite. We take things that seem really simple and we break them down into more complex chunks to understand. And one of the things that we should be thinking about doing is in Indigenous studies is thinking about how can we productively complicate situations? How can we move away from binaries about how people think about indigeneity? How can we move away from ideas that we all think in lockstep? How can we move away from presumptions about what ensues from us all thinking in lockstep because people are only too willing to believe that we either all believe the same thing, all live the same way, all act the same way, yep. and anyone who doesn't isn't really indigenous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these are the binary that colonialism rots, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's very pervasive. Yep. Yeah. Totally cool. Um, so, in line with this question, it's, uh, you know, I haven't been, I've been at the university since 2002 as a student and now as a prof. And, you know, students come on campus every year, September. And it's interesting, I find the sometimes, often, the blossoming that happens for some of our Indigenous students that are coming from reserves or rural areas that have a, um, a smaller sense of the world and then coming onto campus, especially if they're two spirit or genderful or have a different kind of um, sexuality or gender and they come onto our campus and it's like their whole world sort of explodes into all of these different groups on campuses and these supports. There's a, uh, a relatively good acceptance uh, on our campus of these things. And so they're finding themselves on campus. And there's also students that come from places where there's not a lot of ceremony or, or cultural aspects to their lives and they come onto campus and then they have all these resources that, you know, we provide elders, there's lots of um, various ceremonies you can go to, you know, the uh, First Nations, First People's House always puts on a round dance and so uh, they're exposed to all these Hold things. Hold it up for Dion. <laughs> Shana Dion! Woo! Woo Shana! <laughs> Sorry, Dan. Shane is the director. Or she was the director. Now she's the assistant dean of uh, First Nations Métis Inuit students at the University of Alberta. And she's a total badass. And my neighbor. Woo! Absolutely. <laughs> so it's people like Shana that provide these resources for students, some of our Indigenous students and non, but some of our Indigenous students that haven't had access to that. And so coming to the city or an urban place actually explodes that sort of world for them and uh, lets yeah. them talk to various kinds of elders all over. So I don't see it as 
uh, you know, progress. And then that word is a little bit hard to, hard to speak about. Um, but it's like an, um, I keep thinking it's like this explosion of your world. Like not only are you looking at if you're in indigenous studies or other faculties, you know, you're having your mind blown about these histories, but you're also being able to see other indigenous students from various areas around Canada. Mm -hmm. Can I add to that a bit, Tracy? Yeah. Sure. One of the things that it makes me think of when you say that is, there seems to be this, uh, this premise among a lot of Indigenous people that we continue to exist as Indigenous people uh, despite colonialism, right? So we've, we've survived the, the worst that Canada has thrown at us. And there's a certain amount of truth to that, but there's a, another truth that less of us want to talk about, which is that we exist because of colonialism. So it's, it's reproduced particular cultural forms in our communities. And I'm not just talking about bad stuff, I'm talking about kind of uh, kind of good or productive stuff as well. So when you're thinking about people kind of leaving uh, a rural community and coming into an urban space, it makes me think about the ways in which different communities have reacted to kind of the colonial projects that have existed in their areas for, you know, more than a century now. And not everyone has reacted to colonialism in the same way. And not everyone has had the wherewithal to react to colonialism in the same way. So the idea that somehow moving into an urban space automatically means that you're going to get access to less culture than you would back home has a particular understanding or is rooted in a particular understanding again of what the impact of colonialism has been and I, it's a unpopular opinion among a lot of indigenous academics but this whole idea that we somehow exist outside of colonialism is very very difficult to kind of sustain at a, at a very very deep uh, deep level politically of course we make all kinds of claims that stand at odds with with the, the kinds of um, claims that, uh, that Canada makes. But when you think about the fact that we uh, live in a culture of consumption, when you think about the fact that we kind of live in, live in capitalism, all of those different kinds of things, those are, those are kind of, that's deep state shit. That's stuff that kind of floats into our kind of pre-reflective and our unconscious. And it shapes the way in which we relate to ourselves, to other people uh, and to, to other than humans as well. Mm -hmm. So what is it then? Is it, is it an issue or a matter of decolonizing that that sort of our or the the that settler colonialism in our bodies or is it just is it about making relations with that to move on like what is it that we do at this point chris great question tracy do you want to take the first part the body part what <laughs> yeah, you talk about the body tracy what you do i do uh as it pertains to this i'm not sure where i could go with that well, for example, thinking about uh, the fact that uh, that there are healthy uh, sexual experiences among Indigenous people, uh, as opposed to the way in which uh, kind of past confessionals have worked about uh, what kinds of sexual experiences we have. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> huh? keeping it G-rated. Um, yeah, okay. You know, uh, we all go well, get closer. You know, I, I, I'll get closer. Um, <laughs> this is serious now. Um, well, when we talk about, uh, and we have talked about last last uh, module and with Kim Tallbear about missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and genderful folk, you know, and the body sovereignty. And so um, speaking to that and then having, uh, I guess, the opposite of opposite thinking and so you know I told you guys when we made this MOOC we wanted to not come from a deficit model and the same thing when we talk about Indigenous women and girls and body sovereignty as we come from I want to come from a positive space and so creating those spaces through we talked about TP confessions last time and creating those safe spaces for people to be able to discuss those types of things um, to share to explore uh, investigate sort of maybe they don't even know you know who they are that way yet okay. and so I think those are important spaces I'm not sure if I'm answering the question right uh, Paul Chris your turn well I mean along along the same kind of lines what is what does decolonization mean yes if there isn't some sense of existing in a creative tension between freedom and responsibility right so when we think about the 
kinds of relationships that we have to our uh, to our families, to our extended families, all of those kinds of things. What are the ways in which living in a consumer society has impacted that? What are the ways in which we can push against that? But what are also the ways in which we can use it and build on it as ways to, to continue to build uh, relationality? Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Paul was talking earlier about kind of the role of the internet in, um, in the way that we can kind of keep in contact with people. I'm not sure how deep the contact is. I know that there are cousins I haven't talked to in years, but I, you know, I, I like their post when the when it comes up on uh, when it comes up on Facebook. But the 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 point for me, whenever someone talks about decolonization or indigenization, I get I get really suspicious when they've got a, a very firm idea about what that's going to what that's going to look like, mm. because it sort of tells me that there are a lot of other kind of options and opportunities and that kind of compassionate agonism that's been kind of jettisoned along the way. And it's that kind of um, that kind of purity politics that I get really uncomfortable yep. with because I think we're all imperfect people, mostly trying to do our best. And when we start start off with an idea of kind of knowing exactly where we're going, as opposed to sort of being thinking about what it means to be ethical on that journey, I get kind of more more concerned about that, I would say. I think that's really cool because I, I really want to problematize authenticity and what comes with the uh, these identity politics of indigeneity is authenticity. It's like this elder said to do this, wear a skirt like this or this teaching like this. And it becomes this sort of reification of what we are supposed to be rather than seeing what we are doing collectively in each of our little instances of connection and I don't know. It's a, I guess it's more complicated than I can say. Is like we just have to go back to community, right? There's all of these communities, all this pluralism around community, so and communities. So. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the ways in which uh, uh, urban indigeneity adds another layer of complication to all of this, there's a form of anonymity that can take place. I mean, I think it was you, Dan, earlier yes. that was talking about, or maybe it was Paul. I can't remember. I can tell you a part. I just apparently can't tell you your uh, your speech apart. Um, uh, we're different people, Chris. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My face. Uh, <laughs> when you when you think about the ways in which people have since you know really the beginning of time moved into urban spaces as a way to reinvent themselves, as a way to mm -hmm. sort of bring themselves anew. Part of what that has meant over kind of several generations is you're now getting people who are starting to self-identify as Indigenous, whose last person in their family who might have self-identified as Indigenous is two, three, four generations ago. So now you've got this, this kind of weird slash wonderful thing going on where you're getting this kind of regeneration, but these are people that have never grown up with extended family, never grown up with community, don't have a strong understanding of those, of those um, the importance and responsibilities of those relationships, but they they have kind of ingested the purity culture victimhood on the one hand with that kind of white possessive desire to kind of connect with these other things, but lacking kind of the humility and an understanding that this takes a long period of time to, to work through. And so they, this victimhood ends up kind of acting as both sword and shield in terms of their, their the way in which one uses self-identification as the most important indicator of identity in all of the dynamics of identity making that we have in, you know, kind of a contemporary liberal nation state like Canada. And I think those things go on everywhere, but I think there's something about urban spaces and that kind of, that churn and all those different things that are going on that produces particular moments of this kind of thing. You bet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... So I love the idea of talking more about uh, authenticity. And, you know, I, I tell my students this story uh, constantly because there's certain expectations that you have as an Indigenous person. And uh, for someone, and every, and like Chris says, every Indigenous person has various experiences. So perhaps it, you are um, not Indigenous looking, uh, whatever that means. You know, mm -hmm. you're not wearing long hair or braids and have tattoos on your face. Maybe you're, you know, maybe you're like my daughter and looks very fair, right? Uh, yeah. So there's a story. So up, everyone knows what Inuit art looks like, right? And so we have the sculptures and things and they're very fairly recognizable, just like Northwest Coast art. And so when you are an Inuit artist, there are certain expectations of you to create certain things. 
But what, and there's a structure to this as there is with everything. And in, I think it was 1951 and there was this guy named James Houston and he was like some director from the Canadian Craftsman's Guild. And he was up in, in, uh, in the North and he saw these Inuit carvings. So what he did was he created a, a handbook for Inuit carvers to say what Southern buyers want. So um, what materials to use, what kind of shapes they should make and how mm -hmm. they should go about it. And then he created another pamphlet, almost the exact same thing for any buyers. If you want to buy Inuit art, this is exactly what you're going to look for. And so there was this perfect circle of capitalism. And this went on for, you know, decades. Inuits, mm -hmm. Inuit people were had to create these certain things because they had this pamphlet, right? And the buyers, this is what I'm supposed to buy. And so we have this sort of going back to what structures are. This is just one little structure that this guy named James Houston created, thereby, you know, sort of influencing decades of Inuit art. But a good good news to this story is that I think it was in 19 early 70s, uh, they decided to have a contest up there of whatever you wanted to carve, the craziest carving, you know, use your legends, use whatever. And so these Inuit artists were like bursting at the seams, I'm thinking, for their creativity and made these amazing carvings. Like they were sexual in nature, they came from dreams. They were unlike anything people had ever seen before. And they bought it up. They, they were all sold out even before the show came to realization. So when they wanted to have the show down south, of course, there was this expectation, this new Inuit art was coming out and they banned the art show because it was so out of the boundaries <laughs> of what they considered palatable. So why I'm telling you this story is that there is a lot behind how we see and manage our expectations on indigenous people. And this was just one you know, example of Inuit art. Several years ago in Australia, I, I went to an exhibition by a, um, an Indigenous artist there, and she, she had a, a fantastic sense of humor, but you, you all may or may not know that kind of the stere stereotypical depiction of art uh, for Indigenous people in Australia is dot art, right? So you can see a lot of the really famous painters have this dot art, and this, uh, this artist did this exhibition in which she did dot art, but it was, a, it was either a painting or a series of paintings, and all she had done is written had written the word dot 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 dot, 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 dot <laughs> all over the all over the art and then just painted the the word dot in different colors all over the different uh, paintings as a way to push back against those. Mm -hmm. But when you think about when you think about the the kinds of things that that non-indigenous people that white people buy, it also, I mean, again, this comes back to urban indigeneity as well. This is a there's a particular. Uh, economy here and a particular form of life here that is um, that is m made most possible by living in urban spaces. You think about the different galleries that we have in Edmonton that there are in some of the major cities kind of in North America and the kinds of art that they they sell. A lot of this is kind of consumed by non-Indigenous people because non-Indigenous people are the ones that can afford to actually buy this stuff. Yeah. 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 Oh. I'm glad I didn't buy one of those dot things then, Chris. <laughs> I was in Australia. Yeah. That was hilarious. <laughs> no, mm -hmm. I, I constantly have that art critique in my head when I'm, well, I'm thinking about art and doing art. In fact, um, Christy Belcourt had a, he has this particular way of doing art and, you know, in an article without consulting with her. And she uses sort of dots to create these beautiful paintings and someone called it um, traditional Métis dot painting. And she's like, <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> just made up a word and put traditional in front of it to, uh, I guess, to garner more interest from, you know, non-Indigenous buyers. The, the, the art that was enticing people into like buying into the experience of authentic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the yeah, reality it's generating is, authenticity. if you don't have conversations like these and you don't have people in your life to actually say, mm, that doesn't seem right, <laughs> you're only going to self, you're only perpetuating the system um, that has 
you know, allowed for something like that to exist in the first place. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, there's a cuckoo somewhere going, oh, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think she was pretty embarrassed by the whole thing, but, I bet. but we see things on the other hand too. And I, I don't actually, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, it's a big topic for me and very interesting. So we're going to move on to another question and okay. it's 155. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah. Should we jump uh, to the third? Yeah. The real third or the third fourth? <laughs> <laughs> which, which we're really well organized here whichever i mean whichever we you'd like um the one from jillian sure okay mm -hmm. uh so when non-indigenous canadians are raised from an early age to understand these ongoing legacies and indigenous children experience their stories as core to curricula wherever they attend school can't we envision a world that is more inclusive and perhaps even transformed by urban indigeneity? Mm -hmm. Shall we give our guests the uh, opportunity to talk? Yes, please. Uh, well, I, I mean, obviously, people having heard me babble for the last hour, you know what I'm going to say to this. And of course, yes, of course. Of course, we can be more inclusive. Um, and of course, uh, urban indigeneity can transform uh, the way that we live in the world, the way that we look in the world, and, and the way that we move uh, forward in the world. When you think about the kinds of things that go on um, in urban spaces for indigeneity, a lot of that stuff simply isn't possible outside of urban spaces. So you think about the kinds of art that gets created here, you think about the kinds of music that get created here, you think about I don't know more, you think about the forms of social protest, you think about the ways in which social media can function in an urban space that it simply can't in rural spaces. There's all kinds of ways in which urban indigeneity um, has included not has included kind of allies, co-conspirators, whatever term you want to use, non-Indigenous people has tagged them and brought them along for the ride. And that happens in a way in urban spaces, again, which isn't going to happen uh, to the same ex extent in rural spaces, just because of the way that demographics actually uh, operate. And, you know, I often say that urban indigeneity as a, as a, 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 a an ethical approach, as an ethical approach doesn't, doesn't just have the the potential to change the world, it has the potential to save the world because it's a particular way of bringing non-Indigenous people into our space and it's got a particular form of gravitational pull uh, that can draw on the resources, that can draw on the experience and the expertise of uh, like-minded or kind of willing to learn non-Indigenous people uh, to build um, a better, more ethical uh, Canada for sure and to build a, a better and more ethical uh, world in which uh, to live. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. A hundred percent. What do you think about this question, Paul? Um, what would a future look like? What could be transformative about urban indigeneity? I think uh, this question should be posed to Chelsea Vowell next week because of her work on Indigenous Futurisms, which is really yeah. good. I just mm -hmm. think it's amazing, her work. So um, honest, I grew up in the country, so I don't know, like moving, moving to the city was a great big alienation thing mm -hmm. for me, but moving to Edmonton has been so fantastic. It's been filling me up because I'm surrounded by people like, like you, Tracy and Chris, you know, like, and I don't know, it's just, this is <clears throat> Métis, Métis homeland and it feels really good to be here. Yeah. So it's all very situation, it's all very situated. And, um, so I think there's always... It's constantly, it's very difficult, you know, like it's very difficult to understand and to express because these are the things that we just do, right? And to express it and to explain it and to systematize it, it tends towards how, you know, it tends towards how we can reify things and it becomes too, gets away from how, how organic, I hate that word, but how organic things happen in conversation and in community, right? In our mm -hmm. communities. I think there's something that I want to also mention too about how do, why do we always say we consume culture? You know, there's always this possessiveness that comes with culture. And that really is counterintuitive to how, what good relations are. When we possess people, we possess art, and we think we know everything about that 
that thing, right? Like Christy Belcourt's like, what are you talking about? Are you trying, it's like, are you trying to name it, to possess it, to understand it so that you could take it home with you, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like this platform and this MOOC offers everyone an opportunity to just be in the multiplicity of truths and the different knowledges and also to see reflected the different nations that we represent and how complex those things are, right? And how, um, something that we keep referring to, but how we're, our relations, hey, Chris, to, this is totally Chris's ideas, I guess. I don't wanna, I don't wanna speak for you, Chris, but like how we are co-constituted by our relations together within our nations and to each other, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you've said that, Chris. Yeah, that's also Kim Talbert's ideas, the whole idea that's of right. co-constitutive nature. Yeah, and I think it's really true. And like, I see the value and uh, wisdom in that the more we have these conversations together and the more that I want to go home again and to do more conversations with my relatives about about the, our history, you know, and then how do we orient ourselves to each other? So yeah, it's a, it's a long road that has no end because the road is where it ends, right? It's like, this is the path and it's, fan it's so, so much fun. The more fun you have on the path, the more you know that you're doing it right, right? So, mm. so if someone gives you shit for laughing, come on, back mm. off. Mm. <laughs> right, Chris? Um, right. I'm <laughs> laughing. <laughs> uh, Dan, um, from your perspective, and you've talked about from your, you know, your positionality as a, a gay man, someone who's Jewish, you know, you have these communities. Um, what kind of future could you pos could you envision? I mean, how do we move forward with urban indigeneity? What kind of spaces, you know, could we co-create? Could we, you know, envision together with other? not just indigenous communities, but indigenous communities reaching out to, you know, and these can be crossovers, you know, as well, mm -hmm. to Jewish communities, um, new settlers uh, coming in, new immigrants, you know? I think, you know, it, at its core, it's like somewhere along the line, fear was associated with things that we do not know. Mm -hmm. And for me that I don't know where it came from. I don't know whether it's like an intrinsic human reaction, whether it's like a creature thing or whether it is a systemic, whether it's a social, political, whatever it is. But fear, the fear of something new, the fear of things that are different than, you know, than what we know has halted what should be an incredibly celebratory and inspiring experience, which is acknowledging and cherishing communities that are outside of your own. Mm -hmm. There is so much to learn. There's so much to celebrate. There's so much to be inspired by. There's so much artistry. There's so much philosophy. There's so much, um, you know, even in this, in these 10 weeks, it's just, it's a constant reminder of the interconnectedness of humans and how for so long we have been pushing people aside instead of embracing people. And imagine how, imagine how enriching our lives would be if we, instead of pushed people away, pulled them closer. Mm. Imagine how rich our conversations would be. Imagine how much fuller our you know, family dynamics would be if we embraced instead of pushed people away who didn't suit a certain type of, you know, personal idea of what is right and wrong. Like if that was pulled out of the equation, just imagine it's the, the limitless of, it, it's completely limitless in terms of what we could be learning, how we could be growing, how, you know, colorful our lives could be um, because of the fact that, that we are, that, that as a as a planet we are blessed with the fact that there are so many different cultures yeah and yet somehow someone got in there i mean you know in in, in this case it's the the sort of colonial in interruption of um what should be relations and turned out to be um something far far more harmful and 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 destructive. So 
you know, for, for me to be listening and to be watching and to be learning through these, these past 10 weeks, it is just a reminder of how necessary it is to keep your heart and your mind open to um, the human experience and the fact that everyone has a story to tell and, and we, we are way better off listening to those stories than ignoring them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely agree on, on many levels. And there's another thing I'd like to add is um, where would we be technology wise, story wise, um, spiritual wise, if we were able to provide supports to all of the young minds that are up and growing rather than suppressing them because they don't fit into a specific mold, you know, having them conform to certain ways, you know, what are we missing out when we snuff out those little voices and we don't encourage the diversity of voices, but we encourage people to conform, you know? So I'm all about non-conforming and subversiveness, which, you know, really appeals to me a lot. With the Burger oh, King crown. I think we talked about <laughs> last week in terms of the, the, the value in not assigning certain roles. I mean, last week it was based on gender and, yeah. and waiting for the child to dictate to, to the parent where yeah. their interests lie and really leaning into that, those impulses and those experiences instead of shutting them down for, you know, socially constructed ideas. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. My mom's biggest mm -hmm. regret is that she never signed me up for figure skating. And oh, like, you know, because at the time in the eighties and nineties, it was like, they didn't know what was going on. Right. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah. son that like was twirling around the house wanting to be a figure oh. skater. And yeah. I think in a way, it, you know, it's, you end up having these conversations about, about life and about yeah. how parent, how difficult parenting is when you're trying to protect your child from a yeah. world that is not necessarily historically been quite kind mm. um to, to people who are you know are on the kind of fringe of mainstream culture so mm -hmm. in a way it's like and, and we talked about this last week like imagine imagine the the contributions that haven't been made because certain voices yeah. have been snuffed out For sure. and how much you know better off we'd be had they been sort of fostered to a place of of um being respected yeah, exactly. Respected and recognized, yeah. Yeah. I, I keep thinking just to, I keep thinking about why, what works. And uh, and speaking from last week's to this week's, I think there's something operational about um, affection. You know how affection makes things work, you know? Like we, like mm -hmm. there's affection that we can have that it's, that's like between colleagues and ourselves and I don't know and the the relations that we have and I feel like it's such a important thing to recognize I don't even know if it makes sense in the context of this conversation maybe I'm rambling as well but you're just it's saying like, you really like us that's what you're saying I really like you guys exactly well, affection yes oh consensual affection of course because I'm not going to be hugging and kissing you through this this computer <laughs> monitor you know as much as I I really want to but you know. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about they're going to get that quote from you for sure. Oh, gonna, God. You know, we're, we're, we have this, you know, what this COVID situation is and speaking to sort of a lot of these issues that we've been talking about, it's like we have been stripped of physical interaction. Like the human to human yeah. interaction is like one more thing that when this is all, you know, hopefully this, we move past this in a way that we can all kind of one day return to the level of, um, excitement that we have for each other physically, you know, like there's a lot of people in France right now that are like going in for a double kiss and then realizing <laughs> in Montreal, <laughs> but we're, we are being depraved of, of a very necessary part of the human existence. And I yeah. think all of this is, you know, coming through this and working through this, being aware of what's going on and not sort of turning a blind eye to the fact that these are things that we have to be aware of so that when mm -hmm. this is all done, we can actively try to repair instead yeah. of using this as something, as an excuse for, for dismantling a, a, a very necessary part of the human existence or experience rather. Mm. Indeed. Cool. Um, so uh, before we leave off, the Chris, do you have any any last words about Indigenous in the city and uh, anything that we've talked about here? Uh, no, home, Chris. not not really. Other than to 
to, to kind of go back to what we talked about at the beginning, which is to think about the importance of uh, complexity for thinking and talking about uh, urban indigeneity and all indigeneity uh, for that for that matter. And I don't mean complexity as in, you know, complicating things that are morally quite simple. Otherwise, I mean, complexity in terms of kind of understanding that different people come to their indigeneity in different ways. Uh, and that the, the power of 100, 100 years of federalism and 60 years of uh, urbanization have meant that what's going to look uh, kind of indigenous is going to vary not just by province to province, but from city to city. And there was actually a very cool, um, a very cool survey that was done a number of years ago that showed that uh, in some cases, people felt more affinity with other indigenous people in their city than they did with other uh, people from outside their city, but were part of the same legal category as them. So they'd be more likely to see somebody if they were First Nation, they'd be more likely to see an affinity with someone who's Métis within that same city than they would with another First Nation person elsewhere. And all this is to say is that all cities have their gravitational pull and it's a distinctive gravitational pull and it's well worth getting in there and kind of exploding it to think about what all the complexity of indigenous connection to place actually looks like in urban contexts when we're used to talking about indigeneity in place in rural contexts. Wow, that's a good, really good point. Thank you mm -hmm. for that. Thank you, Chris. It, um, yeah, it made me think about um, walking down the street in Edmonton and seeing someone who, to me, looks indigenous and, you know, giving the little, I, I just, I go like this. And, <laughs> and now I can't do that anymore with my mask. I'm like, you know, with your eyes, point my lips. Oh, hey, I'll, let me end with a story. Uh, and I'm hope, I hope Kim is fine with me uh, telling this story. But when Kim first got here, uh, she moved here from Texas, and uh, she lived in a little house in the northern part of um, northern part of Edmonton. And uh, I'm uh, me and my wife were helping her getting getting situated. And I get this call from her, and there's this whispered voice. She said, "Chris," and I said, "Who is this, Kim?" She's like, "Yes." I said, "Kim, what's going on?" And she said. Uh, there are two people here putting one of my bookcases together. And I said, uh, okay. And she said, they're both indigenous. And I said, um, okay, so are you saying that indigenous people can't put book bookcases together? She said, no, you know I'm not saying that. She was basically just <laughs> how happy she was that she could come to a city where there were just kind of indigenous people doing everyday jobs as opposed to oh. just this visibility here that she hadn't seen since she left Minnesota. Aww. That's an awesome story. It calls you to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, so, thanks, Kim. Yes, thanks, Kim. So, um, <laughs> Paul mentioned this already, but we are going to totally ask Chelsea Val next week, who is our next guest uh, for current social movements about Indigenous futurisms, because she does an amazing podcast um, with Molly Swain called Métis in Space, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. for now, um, I really want to say thanks to Chris for coming on with us. It's been great to have you, and uh, I always love hearing your stories and uh, what you have to say. Well, I get honored to honored to be here. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being with us, Chris. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Merci, Chris. Yeah. All right. Well, week eleven, second to last <laughs> week. Although, let's be honest, we'll be tacking that that third week on. I think so. Um, so we, we have a finale, to... Dan. We have to have a finale. We have to have a we have to have a finale. Fireworks, um, Dan. Fireworks. Week eleven next week, um, and until then, uh, I guess. Thank you all at home for, for tuning in and um, we'll see you all in a week. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.